Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga podcast series. This is the book that has changed my life and I would love to repeat it again and again. The very act of reading this book is so deeply transformative. Even though I have read it so many times, reading it again for this podcast and going through line by line, I know how much I am enjoying it and enriching my own inner journey. And I hope you too will be benefiting from this reading. And I suggest, highly, highly recommend you to keep the book with you. This, we are on the third chapter, 17th paragraph, so that we can travel together. And uh, there is a link in the description to the book online. Those who don't have the physical book may get it. So chapter three, paragraph number 17. In the previous episode, which was episode number 15, we saw how mind is an idealist. And Sri Aurobindo even described the idealist dreamers, like the sannyasins of the intellect, who always dream of perfecting the society. And there had been innumerable efforts in the past to perfect society with one or other form of mental idealism. Even in today's world, youngsters now empowering themselves with the power of technology and social enterprises, trying to perfect the society, solve the problems of the world through social enterprises, idealists stepping into that field, thinking of building a better world, a perfect world where there is equality, there is freedom, there is fraternity. So this idealist mind is very progressive in its nature and in its finest developments, it brings the pure, refined culture, aesthetic culture, intellectual culture, refined sensibilities, all that are the contributions even if it fails, and mind do fail, because by itself it cannot entirely lift up the bodily life, and its resistance cannot be met by the mind and its limited capacity. Yet the very effort of the idealist is a promise and a condition for that which is beyond mind to enter and take up this whole work towards a greater perfection, to realize the perfection in material existence. That was the gist of the last episode. Now let's move on to this 16th episode. Let me start. Sorry, it is not 17th paragraph, it is 16th paragraph. Let me read this. That highest thing, the spiritual existence, is concerned with what is eternal, but not therefore entirely aloof from the transient. So we have these two sides. One is the transient. This world of forms, the material world is very transient, like waves upon the surface of an ocean. It waves come, waves go. These two will pass. The very famous line among the, those who follow the path of Buddha, these two will pass. It's transient. On the other hand, there is the eternal spirit, timeless, unborn, deathless spirit. So that highest thing, the spiritual existence, is concerned with what is eternal, but not therefore entirely aloof from the transient. It is concerned with eternal, but doesn't mean that it is entirely aloof and disconnected and not concerned about the transient existence, our daily life, its ups and downs, its birth and death, its cycles of happiness and sorrow, all that. It's not aloof from it, though it is concerned about that which is eternal. For the spiritual man 
the mind's dream of perfect beauty is realized in an eternal love, beauty and delight that has no dependence and is equal behind all objective experiences. Its dream of perfect truth in the supreme, self-existent, self-apparent and eternal variety which never varies but explains and is the secret of all variations and the goal of all progress. Its dream of perfect action in the omnipotent and self-guiding law that is inherent forever in all things and translate itself here in the rhythm of the worlds. A long line. Let's unpack it. For the spiritual man, the mind's dream of perfect beauty is realized in an eternal love, beauty and delight that has no dependence and is equal behind all objective appearances. That's the first part of the sentence. For the mind, there is this dream of perfect beauty, perfect love, perfect delight. But mind is struggling to achieve it. Even if it gets a glimpse of it, it falls back. But for the spirit, it's already existing in the spiritual existence. Eternal love, beauty and delight. And that is self-existence. It has no dependence on anything external. It is self-existent. And it is equal behind all the appearances. What does it mean? Equal behind all appearances. Objective appearances. In our objective world, our normal ex experience is of love and hatred. Everything that operates in duality, beautiful and the ugly, delight and pain. Everything operates in duality and the full gradation of in between. That which is dull and boring and then that which is beautiful and delightful and that which is painful and terrible. So there is this contradiction and duality in the material objective existence. Whereas for the spirit, there is an equal love, beauty and delight, self-existence, self-existent, independent of the objective phenomena. The way we individual humans experience it. We live in the mind. Mind is a field of duality. And there is truth and falsehood and good and bad and ugly and all the duality is playing out. But that is how the mind sees and the limitation of the mind. And this limitation doesn't exist in the spiritual reality. There, it is self-existent love, beauty and delight. So, for the spiritual man, the mind's dream of perfect beauty is realized in an eternal love, beauty and delight that has no dependence and is equal behind all objective appearances. That's the first part of the sentence. Now let's move on to the next part of the sentence. Its dream of perfect truth in the supreme, self-existent, self-apparent and eternal variety which never varies but explains and is the secret of all variations and the goal of all progress. Its dream of perfect truth in the supreme, self-existent, self-apparent. It is self-existent, it's self-apparent. It's very evident at that level of existence. And the eternal variety which never varies here, Variety is, first variety is with capital V. It is from that spiritual eternal seed. Et, eternal variety which never varies. Say for 
Example, if you look at human beings, we are more than 8 billion. On one hand, there is something that is common for entire humanity. And at the same time, every human body is an endless variation. Every fingerprint is unique. Every iris is unique. Yet, there is something that is unchanging and eternal, a unique type. For every species, there is a type. Out of that type, an endless variety. It's like a template out of which infinite variations can arise. And this type exists in the eternal consciousness, out of which comes the endless variety. So eternal variety which never varies because it is a variant of the one. Whether it is one becoming different species or within a given species having a multiple endless variation of the same species, it is still the one. So eternal variety which never varies. It's a description of that eternal existence but explains and is the secret of all variations. So behind all variations, there is the secret of one thing that is finding its endless variations. And the goal of all progress, there is an ideal reference towards which all progress is moving. The golden ratio in mathematics they have discovered towards which all this movement is trying to reach, a perfection towards which one is trying to reach. Society is trying to reach the perfect love, perfect beauty, perfect delight. Human beings have this impulse towards finding the perfect love, perfect beauty, perfect delight. We reach, but we fall back. We reach, get a tiny glimpse, we fall back. Whereas in the spirit, this is self-existent, and there is an endless variation of these themes, whether it is in terms of experience of delight or creation of the world of forms, even if it is transient, there's an endless variation. The same theme can be expressed in hundreds and hundreds of variety of ways. And the same delight can be experienced in endless variations. So, it's dream of perfect truth in the supreme, self-existent, self-apparent and eternal variety which never varies but explains and is the secret of all variations and the goal of all progress. Next is, it's dream of perfect action in the omnipotent and self-guiding law. Mind dreams of a perfect action. Mind dreams of omnipotence and the self-guiding law. That is inherent forever in all things and translates itself here in the rhythm of the worlds. So, what mind dreams? Here it is self-existent. that It has its omnipotence. It has its self-guiding law. And it is inherent forever in all things. Everything in manifestation, deep within it, is presiding the spiritual reality. And it is guiding the unfolding of every form in time and space. And this power seated within and behind all things and above all things is omnipotent and it is also guiding from within that is inherent forever in all things and translates itself here in the rhythm of the worlds. The creative movement in nature is rhythmic. We take large cycles, time cycles, for example, day cycles, day and night, it fits into the week cycles, fits into the month cycles, fits into the year cycles, and larger cycles. There is a rhythm of seasons, a seasonal unfolding of nature. So there is a tree that is growing and becoming a seed, again becoming a, uh, a seed becoming a tree, and tree 
uh, condensing itself back into the seed and even the within the growth process of a tree there is seasonal cycles of blooming in full glory and then entering into a deep sleep of winter between the full spectrum there is this flourishing of leaves and so the whole range of seasonal variations there is a rhythm to it a rhythmic process so is our own individual human journey it has a rhythm and it is when we go out of rhythm when we become out of sync with nature the conflict arises the challenges arises animals live in the harmony of that rhythm even in their very movement we can see the rhythm of their flight of the birds or the walking of the animals the way they run there is a rhythm and flow in all things whether it is <clears throat> physical movement <clears throat> in our subjective reality there is psychological movement it has its rhythmic cycles but we are not aware we lose the rhythm but the more we attune to the spiritual reality from there comes the rhythmic unfolding and it is guiding everything so it translate itself here in the rhythm of the worlds so let me read that one line again for the spiritual man the spiritual man the mind's dream of perfect beauty is realized in an eternal love beauty and delight that is no dependence and is equal behind all objective appearances it's a dream of perfect truth in the supreme self existent self apparent and eternal variety which never varies but explains and is the secret of all variations and the goal of all progress it's a dream of perfect action in the omnipotent and self-guiding law that is the inherent that is inherent forever in all things and translates here in the rhythm of the worlds what is fugitive vision or constant effort of creation in the brilliant self is an eternally existing reality in the self that knows and is the lord so from our uh, progressive mind perspective there is a constant effort and a vision and an idealism towards which we are striving but for that self in the brilliant self is an what is fugitive vision or constant effort of creation in the in the brilliant self is an eternally existing reality in the self that knows and is the lord the self is also the lord that is presiding over this entire moment it is a brilliant self it has its omnipotent omnipotence self guiding law that is leading everything in evolution and it has its self existent love beauty delight self existent perfection all that is its very nature but if it is often difficult for the mental life to accommodate itself to the dully resistant material activity how much more difficult must it seem for the spiritual existence to live on in a world that appears full not of the truth but of every lie and illusion not of love and beauty but of an encompassing discord and ugliness not of law of truth but of victorious selfishness and sin it is already difficult for progressive mind to really master the bodily life we have already touched upon that if it is difficult for the mind how much more difficult it is for the spiritual to live in this world which is full of every lie and illusion and all encompassing discord and ugliness and victorious selfishness and sin 
the selfishness is so victorious in the current existing world and all kinds of ugliness, crude, sinful activities. Whereas the spirit has its nature of truth, love, beauty, all that, the law of truth, all that is the very nature, whereas this world is so full of lie and illusion, discord and ugliness and selfishness and sin. So how much more difficult it is for that pure spirit to really live in this world, for the spiritual existence to live on in a world that appears full of, full, not of the truth, but of every lie and illusion, not of love and beauty, but of an all, but an encompassing discord and ugliness, not of the law of truth, but of victorious selfishness and sin. Therefore, the spiritual life tends easily in the saint and sannyasin to withdraw from the material existence and reject it either wholly and physically or in the spirit. It is because of this difficulty of this huge gap between the self-existent delight of the spirit, its beauty, its delight, its harmony, power of truth, all that. That world is so different from our material existence and its world where this ugliness, falsehood is rampant. Therefore, there is this tendency for the sannyasin or the saint to withdraw from material existence, reject it either wholly and physically or in the spirit. So a large number of the seekers of the spirit, when they get a glimpse of that spiritual reality and taste of it, they do not want to deal with this world and its limited life and its crudeness, victorious selfishness. Often the world is described as like a tail of a dog. You cannot straighten it. No matter how much you try to straighten it, it will curl back to the old form. So the progressive mind tried to straighten it, make it more and more beautiful, but it will curl back. And the spirit also found that it, it is nearly impossible, so forget it. So they tend to withdraw, reject, renounce, at least in spirit, say forget it. I don't want to deal with it. Therefore, the spiritual life tends easily in the saint and sannyasin to withdraw from the material life and reject it either wholly and physically or in the spirit. It sees the, this world as the kingdom of evil or of ignorance. And the eternal life, eternal divine, either in a far off heaven or beyond where there is no world and no life. So therefore, it sees this world as a kingdom of evil and of ignorance and eternal and the eternal and divine either in a far off heaven or beyond where there is no world and no life. So we can see spiritual philosophies proclaiming that this world is an illusion, you're trapped in it. This world is nothing but sorrow and suffering. The very purpose of spiritual life is to end the very cycle of birth into this misery. And you can liberate from this entanglement and dissolve yourself in the eternal glory of the spirit and forget this world. That had been the solution and that eternal beauty and delight is not in this world but beyond this world. The eternal and divine either far off heaven or beyond where there is no world and no life. So there is no manifestation, there is no life. It is eternal, timeless existence beyond time and space, beyond birth. That became the aim for many spiritual schools of India. 
and they are still prevalent in the modern world. And that's something that we need to consciously recognize and course correct. It separates itself inwardly, if not also physically, from the world, world's impurities. It asserts the spiritual reality in a spotless isolation. Spotless isolation. Therefore, when in India this tendency began, that's when the separation of the spiritual seeker from the mainstream life and the creation of the monastic life began. Even within monasteries, creation of the monks and the nuns began. And into their spotless isolation in the remote regions where they are untouched by the impurities of the worldly existence. So it separates itself inwardly if not also physically. One is inwardly isolating oneself. Other is also physically isolating oneself within the confines of your ashrams, within the confines of the monastery, so that you are untouched from the world's impurities. So it separates itself inwardly, if not also physically, from the world's impurities. It asserts the spiritual reality in a spotless isolation. There is a purity of the spiritual reality. And it isolates into that. This withdrawal renders an invaluable service to the material life itself by forcing it to regard and even to bow down to something that is the direct negation of its own petty ideals, sordid cares, and egoistic self-content. That's another paradox of it. On one hand, this monastic life, the ashram life, which isolates itself away from the life of the mainstream society. And this monastic life is fundamentally an absolute negation of the mainstream life of ignorance, sorrow and suffering and its ideal of comfort and pleasures and all that the material man seeks. A pleasurable, comfortable life where all the variety of food and consumer culture and the variety of enjoyments and all that, the spiritual man denies the whole thing into that spotless isolation. And yet, that very isolation compels this material life, material man to bow down to that spotless isolation, which is the very contradiction of the material man's daily routine ideals. So this withdrawal renders an invaluable service to the material life itself. So even though the material life lives in its indulgence of its sensory pleasures and enjoyment and comfort and self-preservation and conservation, this very existence of the spotless isolation of the spiritually realized man who and the sanghas, the monasteries and ashrams, the very existence shows a higher ideal. Even if you cannot reach it, it is still a lived reality. And therefore, the material man bows down to it even when it is contradicting all his personal life ideals. And it imprints that greater goal of life, of evolution, in the material life. So this withdrawal renders an invaluable service to the material life itself by forcing it to regard and even to bow down to something that is the direct negation of its own petty ideals, sordid cares, and egoistic self-content. Next line. But the work in the world of so supreme 
a power. A spiritual force cannot be thus limited. Spiritual power is a tremendous power. The work in the world of so supreme a power as spiritual force cannot be thus limited. So it should not limit itself into that spotless isolation. The spiritual life also can return upon the material and use it as a means of its own greater fullness. So there is a greater fullness possible for the spiritual life. For that, it has to return upon the material. The spiritual life can also return upon the material and use it as a means of its own greater fullness. Use the material life as a means of its own greater fullness. Refusing to be blinded by the dualities, the appearances. It can seek in all appearances whatsoever the vision of the same Lord, whatsoever the vision of the same Lord, the same eternal truth, beauty, love and delight. So the material world is full of its duality of good and evil, truth and falsehood, ugly and beautiful. But it is perfectly possible for the spiritual man to establish in that one reality behind all things and to see through the contradictions of duality and see the one Lord behind all the appearances, the same Lord, the same eternal truth, same beauty, same love, same delight. What appears to be Painful, painful and gory to the normal senses and progressive mind from a spiritual reality one can see it as the same Lord, master of existence, same beauty, same delight. So we can see in the Bhagavad Gita it is given in the battlefield where Arjuna was asked to take his bow and arrow and fight. A tremendous violence from the perspective of duality. A tremendous battle. But behind it is that one Lord of existence and great tremendous beauty of the evolutionary process and its crescendo. The battle itself, every filmmaker would know how to build up a crescendo, the conflict speaking of the conflict and the confrontation, the battle and the rasa of the battle. So Indian aesthetic traditions have this nava rasas, not only the peaceful and romantic, but also the heroic and the most fearful, fearsome, furious and violent. All that behind it, there is a rasa of vipatsa. And uh, the heroism finds its glory in the battlefield. So the same truth, beauty, love and delight can be seen when you establish in the spiritual reality and engage with the world, with its apparent contradictions, its conflicts, its battles. Behind it, all that, who it is, it is the same Lord. So refusing to be blinded by the dualities, the appearances, it can seek in all appearances whatsoever the vision of the same Lord, the same eternal truth, beauty, love and delight. The Vedantic formula of self in all things, all things in the self and all things as becomings of the self is the key to this richer and all embracing yoga. So there is this Vedantic formula of the self in all things behind every appearance of an individualized existence. There is the self. Same self is existing in all forms. And at the same time, all things exist in the self. 
these are two poises. In everything, there is the self. On the other side, other, on the other side there is all things existing in the self. And all things as becomings of the self. If that vast self is the ocean, out of which a wave rolling out is that individual self or individual form of life, which is the Vedantic formula. The Vedantic formula of the self in all things and all things in the self and all things as the becomings of the self is the key to this richer and all-embracing yoga. So when the yoga become all-embracing and rich, this is the perspective it takes. It embraces the world from this voice of there is self behind all things and all things exist in the self and all things are nothing but the becomings of the self. From that voice, we have a richer and all-embracing yoga. But the spiritual life, like the mental, may thus make use of this outward existence for the benefit of the individual with a perfect indifference to any collective uplifting of the merely symbolic world which it uses. This is another possibility. Just like in the case of the mind, Sri Aurobindo was referring to the Epicureans of the Greek, ancient Greek, where you use the outward life and its society for the perfection of the mind and its own journey without essentially deeply having real concern to uplift the whole race. The same thing can happen in the spiritual voice as well. You may use the outer life and its battle and context as a means for your own freedom and perfection without actually having the concern to lift up the whole race. That too is possible. Like you may turn towards life and embrace life, still it may be only for your own spiritual growth, not necessarily having that deep concern to lift up the whole race. So, but the spiritual life, like the mental, may thus make use of this outward existence for the benefit of the individual with a perfect indifference to any collective uplifting of the merely symbolic world it uses. Merely symbolic words. You can look at the world as nothing but a symbolic world. There is only one self unfolding itself into multiplicity of forms and every form is nothing but a symbol of that eternal self. And why care? What matters is the eternal self alone. And so you use the outer world and its material reality and the challenges as a means to see through it, know the eternal self and liberate yourself into the spiritual reality without actually helping the material world and material life and the whole race to be lifted. Since the eternal is since the eternal is forever the same in all things, and all things the same to the eternal, since the exact mode of action and the result are of no importance compared with the working out in oneself of the one great realization, this spiritual indifference accepts, no matter what environment, no matter what action, dispassionately prepared to retire, as soon as its own supreme end is realized. That's another long line. So since the eternal is forever the same in all things, so that, that's why we refer to that as the eternal. It is the same behind all forms. Forms are transient. They come and go, but there is some, the self is eternal. Uh, it is the unchanging ground. Since the Eternal is forever the same in all things, and all things the same to the eternal. For the eternal, all things are the same. It is born out of its own substance. Since the exact mode of action and the result are of no importance, if that's the situation, if 
eternal is the same behind everything and all things are same for the eternal then all the modes of action and the result are immaterial isn't it if everything is nothing but the self and everything is existing in the self and for the self everything is the same then there is really no difference between which means you use that's the kind of logical possibility that he is pointing at here since exact mode of action and the result are of no importance whatever be the result everything is happening in this eternal existence whatever me the means whether it looks ugly crude violent noble how does it matter to the spirit it doesn't matter at all is of no importance compared with the working out in oneself of the great realization so as a seeker if your purpose is to only realize the eternal self the means with which you arrive at the result does it really matter because one can arrive at this kind of a logical question if your goal is to liberate into the spiritual reality compared with the working out in oneself of the one great realization this spiritual indifference accepts no matter what environment no matter what action dispassionately prepared to retire as soon as its own supreme end is realized so the moment you realize the self you're done you retire and whatsoever be the means that you use to arrive at that end doesn't matter and this is one of the directions or attitudes one may take and this is a possibility so sri arbindo is warning about it and let me read it again since the eternal is forever the same in all things and all things the same to the eternal since the exact mode of action and result are of no importance compared with the working out in oneself of the great great realization this spiritual indifference accepts no matter what environment no matter what action dispassionately prepare to retire as soon as its own supreme end is realized so one can utilize the world and its challenges as a means for one's own realization but by itself it doesn't lift up the race that is the fundamental difference it is so that many have understood the ideal of the gita so there had been interpretations of the bhagavad gita do whatever in the world it doesn't matter because end of the day everything is nothing but the self the supreme purushottama the outer form of action doesn't matter what matters is your liberation out of this battlefield into the spiritual realization and once you realize it retire from the world you're done with it because one can interpret the gita in this way as well that is what sri aurobindo is pointing at here it is so that many have understood the ideal of the gita or else the inner love and bliss may pour itself out in the world in good deeds in service in compassion the inner truth in the giving of knowledge without therefore attempting the transformation of a world which must by its inalienable nature remain a battlefield of the dualities of sin and virtue of truth and error of joy and suffering another big line long line so this is another possibility that is the inner love and bliss may pour itself out in the world in good deeds in service in compassion so we can see that you realize and you can pour your inner love and bliss into the world in good deeds in service in compassion and you can also bring in the inner truth in giving knowledge you can teach people give knowledge 
without therefore attempting the transformation of the world. So here he is pointing at something else here. Even this very teaching and sharing of your love and bliss, it is still can be done without transforming the world, without attempting the transformation of a world, which must by its inalienable nature remain a battlefield of the dualities. World is accepted as a battlefield of dualities. Its very nature with its sin and virtue, its truth and error, joy and suffering, that's the very nature of the world. And you're pouring out your love and bliss to the world and giving your teachings helping people to get out of that battlefield into the spiritual reality. Still leaving the world as it is. People can liberate themselves into the, liberation, into the spiritual reality. Know the self-existent love and beauty and delight. You are still not transforming the world. Your teaching is still about helping people to get out of the world. So the whole way of looking at it is fundamentally different here. If the whole race is to be lifted up to a spiritual reality, something else is required. And this is one of the fundamental distinctions we need to understand. So many of the spiritual teachings, we can see when we dive deep into it, what we again and again discover is, the description that the world is maya, an illusion, a suffering, and one can end it by withdrawing from the world into spiritual self, formless, eternal, timeless existence. And that is the purpose of spiritual journey. And this is a fundamental limitation and an error. And it's a very, very important aspect to be understood. And that's why Sri Aurobindo is building up in detail this whole process and nuanced differences, understanding, so that we begin to grasp what he is bringing in through integral yoga and the transformation of the world, evolutionary transformation, evolutionary transformation of the world what that is, in order to really grasp it, we need to understand this difference. Even a spiritual teaching that pours itself out into the world only to help people to get out of the world is not what Sri Aurobindo is bringing in. So with that, let's end this 16th episode. Thank you for your time, your journey, traveling together, share your feedback. See you next Wednesday. Thank you.